What's up, my friend? My name is Andretti. We'll be reacting to America dismantles pirate nations for touching their boats. But before I go into that, can I ask you for one thing? If you can leave a like on this video, thank you so much for that. It's the best way to show support. If you can subscribe, oh man, in that case, forget about it. You make my day. Have that in consideration. Now, link for the original video in my description. Nick, what an amazing content creator. Give him some love. That said, let's play it. Ah yes, that time that pirates kept messing with American ships, so George Washington founded the United States Navy to do something about it. Yeah, the United States Navy was founded for the sole reason of hunting pirates. Wait, is that true actually? Because if that's true, that's an amazing fun fact. I have no idea. <laughs> Today we're talking about the Barbary Wars. Ladies and gentlemen, it is pretty much an ongoing internet joke that you do not mess with America's boats. You That's know, true. because of Operation Praying Mantis, that time that America decided they were going to sink half of Iran's navy in like eight hours. Yeah. And and Vietnam and and World War II. Yeah. And World War One. Yeah. And the Spanish-American War and the War of 1812. I, I think we, we got the point, Nick, right there. Um basically do not mess with America boats or uh, you will regret. Um, I guess if you're not picking up what I'm putting down, I'm trying to tell you. Oh, yeah. This is the origin story of why you don't mess with America's boats. But first, a word from our sponsor, because this video is brought to you by my favorite underwear company, Sheath. Wait, hold on. I'm supposed to. Okay, so I don't skip sponsors. You can do it. I will not do it since I'm reacting to his stuff. By the way, I love that electrician. Give him uh, some love and leave a like on this video if you like my reactions to, to his content. To read a script for this one. Here's how to do a perfect ad read for our company. Let's take a quick second to thank our favorite sponsor for today's show, which is Sheath Underwear. Mm. Sheath makes the most comfortable boxer briefs ever worn. And Clarence's parents have a real good marriage. This shit's fucking lame. Okay, look, here's the deal. Whether you're talking to a veteran, a construction worker, or your dad, they're all going to tell you that there's one universal truth to life. And that truth is that cargo pockets are fucking awesome. You're goddamn right. Yeah. If you think cargo shorts are cool, wait till you try cargo underwear, except the cargo pocket is made with balls not being stuck to your thigh technology. That's and crazy. I'm not thinking, but chubby electron guy, what if I try them out and I don't like it? Cool. Just wear them like normal underwear and then you have a bonus cargo pocket. Nobody in the history of mankind has ever been like, damn it, I have too many available cargo pockets. It's never Th happened. That's true. Cargo shorts are not even cute at all. First of all, cargo shorts are awesome. They Wait, this this is wife. Oh, that's amazing. They always have been. Second of all, you know what you and this cargo pocket have in common? You don't feel either of us? Well, at least I know who... Um, I think I'm not going to comment, right? But um, he needs to, 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 to delete this video. I'm not letting put their phone in my pocket next time we go somewhere. Anyways, if you wanted to try some sheath cargo underwear for yourself or buy some as a gift for your significant other, I'll have them linked in the description down below. And sure. you can use the discount code Fat Electrician for 20% off. Back to the video. All right, let's do it. For three centuries, pirates from the Barbary states of Morocco, Algiers, Tunis, and Tripoli would raid merchant vessels in the Mediterranean, mm. steal all the goods, and imprison and turn all of the crew members into slaves. So. This was actually a big problem, right? A big, big problem. I did. I had no idea that America was one of the nations stopping this. That's really, really nice. <laughs> Why was this allowed to go on for over 300 years? Well, the only navies powerful enough to stop these pirates at the time were the Spanish, the French, and the British. And oh man, I thought I was about. I, what, what about the Portuguese? I guess not. Okay. They all came to the same conclusion that it would be cheaper to pay off the pirates, giving them a yearly tribute to not raid their ships mm. rather than go to war with them. So now those three empires aren't getting their ships raided, which is fine. That's a good thing, I guess. But here's the catch with it that they may or may not have known at the time, but they definitely figured out somewhere along the way. Now the pirates are only raiding all the smaller nations. Okay. okay. It's like Walmart, Target, and Amazon getting together, encouraging shoplifting, knowing that they can shoulder the financial burden, but it puts all the other mom and pop stores out of business and they become the only ones selling goods. Except That's actually a great comparison. The problem is they probably had no idea that America was becoming a, a giant. 
instead of retail stores, we're talking about entire nations. This goes on for literally hundreds of years, but America is still part of the British Empire, so mm. they fall under their umbrella of protection, so it's never an issue. That is until okay. the American Revolution started on April 19th, 1775, with the shot heard around the world, the Battle of Lexington and Concord, and the famous story of a 78-year-old veteran going out into his front yard and shooting three redcoats as they retreated back to Boston, sending the message for all of America that the British Empire should get off of our lawn. Fast forward 1783, America wins the Revolutionary War, officially becoming its own country, and all of America's merchant vessels start flying the old red, white, and blue. And pretty Such a beautiful flag. And by the way, I have a video reacting to the history of the American Revolution. Uh, the video was done by Oversimplified, and I thought it was an amazing, amazing video much immediately 1784 one of america's merchant vessels is captured by barbary pirates from the country of morocco as an act of good faith for a new nation spain actually pays off the pirates gets the american vessel and all of its crew back returns it to america and then advises the american government hey you guys should start paying these guys off too okay good action by spain but uh, the thing is knowing america as i know at this point I don't think my old fella George Washington would, would like this idea. That's what all the big nations are doing. At which point, America's minister to France, a guy by the name of Thomas Jefferson, chimes in and he's like, no, absolutely not. I'm going to go talk to him. Now, yeah. obviously, I'm paraphrasing here, but basically Thomas Jefferson rolls up and he's like, hey, don't ever fuck with my boats ever again or else. At which point, the Sultan of Morocco is like, I'm sorry, who are you? I'm Thomas Jefferson, one of the founding fathers of America. You know, we just kicked the British out of our entire country. We're our own thing now. Okay. I'm sorry, you fucking pilgrims did what now? We beat the British in war and now we are our own country. You mean to tell me that a bunch of colonial farmers with muskets went toe to toe with the largest military on the planet that is so good at war that they can literally wear high vis red coats the entire time and still win and you beat them? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, they, they, yeah. They, they beat them and Washington was a hero on that uh, on that war. Exactly what I'm telling you. I mean, yeah, I could probably just leave your boats alone from now on. That historically seems like it's going to be a really good idea. And that is the story of how Morocco came to be the first country to recognize America as its own sovereign nation by signing the Moroccan American Treaty of Peace and Friendship, which is the first and longest lasting peace treaty in American history. At which point okay, that's amazing. <laughs> well, at least Morocco, honestly, Loki Morocco kind of smart because uh, imagine some some other nation may think no chance we are going to destroy these American guys at least Morocco said okay never mind yeah yeah no no your boats will be fine from now on Thomas Jefferson is like wow that actually worked out perfect I'm gonna go to the other three Barbary states and tell them the same thing now mm. but of course there's gonna be a catch with that you see there's four Barbary states but Morocco is the only one that's actually truly independent and the other three are just subservient branches of the Ottoman Empire. So mm. Thomas Jefferson and John Adams go to talk to the ambassador of Tripoli and they're like, hey, can all the Ottoman Barbary states leave our- The ambassador of Tripoli? Wait, is this some joke that I'm not understanding? Our boats alone. At which point the ambassador informs them, absolutely not. You see, we're part of the Ottoman Empire. We don't need to listen to you. We're not scared of you guys. And it is our official stance that, and I quote, it was written in the Quran that all nations which had not acknowledged the prophet were sinners who it was the right and duty of the faithful to plunder and enslave. You know, and No, I'm not going to Unless they give us money, of course. Everything's got a price, apparently. So Thomas Jefferson is like, well, okay, we're going to war then. And that's when John Adams is like, whoa, 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 calm down. Let's just pay the tribute so that our ships can be fine. We already disbanded the Continental Navy after winning the Revolutionary War. We don't have a Navy to fight these guys. We just have to give them the money. So that's what happened. For the next eight to 10 years, America would pay tribute every year to these three remaining Barbary states. And every year they wanted more and more money. And eventually even mm -hmm. that wasn't enough because Algiers began attacking American vessels anyways. Okay, if you're not picking up what I'm- Oh, this is actually, I was not expecting this, but uh, I'm pretty sure they, they had a plan. They basically just need more time to, to build a stronger Navy. But I actually, I was not expecting this. I'm trying to tell you that for the first time in American history, somebody has fucked with one of America's boats and they're not immediately sorry about it yet. The president at the time, George Washington, goes to Congress My and man. pretty much tells them what's going to happen because at this point in time, George Washington is basically the king of America. Nobody actually knows if he's going to step down from presidency or not. So he's like, hey, guess what? 
you guys are going to pass the Naval Act of 1794, establishing the United States Navy. And at the very top of that document, it very clearly states that the purpose we are building the United States Navy is so that we can combat Algerine Corsairs, which is just a fancy word for state funded pirates. Yes, I'm telling okay. you that the founding document of the most powerful Navy the world has ever seen at the top specifically states the sole reason for their creation is to hunt down and destroy pirates that had the audacity to fuck with one of America's ships. We have a okay, that's kind of fantastic, I have to admit. Of course, the Navy nowadays is for different things, but uh, the original story is its amazing. That's why I love Fatal Adrushan's channel, because uh, at least all the videos I saw from him is always something that, uh, he, he, first of all, his humor, I think, is, is kind of amazing. But he's always something that is a really, really fun fact. He's, he's almost unbelievable. I, I, I love it officially entered the find out portion of the story. Okay. America immediately commissions the building of six enormous frigates covered in guns to go fight these pirates. Fast forward to when the frigates are done. It takes a couple years. It is now 1798 mm. and George Washington has decided to step down from power, allowing for an election to happen. And we are now into the second president of America, John Adams. And John Adams decides he would rather keep paying tribute. Disappointed. God damn it. I mean, why? Jordan! America just created the Navy, spent a million dollars creating all these frigates, and now John Adams isn't going to use them for their intended purpose. Obviously, a lot of people are upset, including his own vice president, Thomas Jefferson. So Thomas Jefferson, the vice president at the time, immediately begins campaigning to run against the sitting president mm. in the next election. And one of his biggest platforms is that he is gonna go fight these pirates rather than pay them tribute. And his slogan for this is, and I quote, millions in defense before a cent in tribute. Okay, just so we're clear, Thomas like Jefferson's that. platform for running for president is I'm going to spend millions of dollars in defense, which might as well be hundreds of billions of dollars at that point, because America no longer negotiates with terrorists. And I'm pretty sure my high school English teacher would refer to this as foreshadowing. So Thomas Jefferson wins the election. Honestly, Thomas Jefferson, I'm getting a lot of respect for him. Honestly, I mean, I like his position. You really do not ne negotiate this type of stuff because they will always want more and more. I like this guy. The entire world. I think he is one of the best presidents ever, right? So much respect to him. Finds out that he's going to be the third president of the United States of America. And then on March 4th, 1801, the day of his inauguration, he receives a letter from Yusuf Karmanali, the Pasha of Tripoli. If you don't know, Pasha is like the dictator, the king, the president, the, the main dude in charge. And at this point, Thomas Jefferson, the guy who just ran an entire presidential campaign on I'm going to go fight pirates, is thinking in his head like maybe... This guy found out that I'm about to send a Navy over there to beat him up and he's going to send an apology. Maybe he wants to sign a peace treaty like Morocco did. This is already working out great. I might not even have to send my Navy over there. He opens the letter and Pasha Yusuf Karmanali has decided that he is going to poke the Pilgrim King because he is now demanding that because of the new administration, the United States owes him an extra $225,000 in tribute. And Thomas Jefferson is pissed. I mean, yeah, and with good reason. By the way, is Thomas 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 Jefferson is in the Mount Rushmore of the American president? Because I know you guys have Lincoln and Washington there, but the other two is, I believe, also Benjamin Franklin, Franklin, right? And is Thomas Jefferson the the fourth? I, I can Google this after the the video, but um, now I'm curious. I get crazy with it. Originally, Thomas Jefferson was going to have to go to Congress, get permission to activate the Navy, to send them over there to fight these pirates, but not now. He's so mad, we're activating the rainbow shortcut to ass whooping land, and Pasha Yusuf is going to have some consequences oh, immediately boy. because he's sending the Navy today. Yeah. Well, like I said, it takes a literal act of Congress to send the U.S. Navy over there on a military mission, so Thomas Jefferson is like, that's fine, we just won't send them on a military mission. Fill up one of our frigates with a bunch of gifts and peace offerings for Pasha Yusuf, and then give it a nice, healthy escort of other frigates to defend it and send them on their merry way to deliver the gifts right after oh boy i like i like this president a lot i have to be honest that's a tremendous idea 100 i would also do that if i was president he gives the command probably not but you guys get the point i i like the idea 
commander of the United States Navy the standing order that he is also to defend any American citizen or ship from any potential mm. aggression. Not aggression, potential aggression. If he thinks that somebody... Oh no, potential aggression. So basically this means... Means that they will destroy them, no matter what they do. ...else might be thinking about doing something aggressive. Take them out, take them down. Yeah. Do your stuff. So the Navy set sail. One of the best videos that I, I reacted about... Uh, um, uh, uh, one of the best videos that, that I reacted with fatal attrition was the proportional. It's kind of crazy. I mean, uh, you kill my dog, I kill your country. Basically, that's the proportional way of America. <laughs> and to be honest, kind of works. Let's run it back. Out, take them down. Do your, do your stuff. So the Navy sets sail. They're gone. They're in route. Mm. Thomas Jefferson sitting in his office and he comes to the realization, man, I'm pretty sure these pirates are going to attack him, but if they don't, they're actually going to end up giving Pasha what's his nuts a bunch of these gifts, and I can't have it. So yeah, no. he whips out the old quill and parchment, and he writes a letter back and sends that off. And that letter basically reads, hey, America's done giving you tribute for the rest of forever, F off. And obviously the letter makes it there first, at which point Pasha goes to the American consulate building and chops down the flagpole with the American flag on it which in that part of the world is how you declare war. So the U.S. Navy shows up off the coast of the Barbary States. The pirates attack them because they've already declared war. The U.S. Navy defends themselves. Word gets back to America. Congress then is like, oh, hey, we're at war. We're going to go ahead and give Thomas Jefferson permission to use the United States Marine Corps at his discretion. And this is... Okay, this went up working perfectly for Thomas Jefferson. Oh man, this was a great, great plan. Why, to this day, the United States Marine Corps is the only branch of the U.S. military that can be sent and deployed anywhere in the world without congressional approval. So for the next two okay. years, the U.S. Navy and the Marine Corps set up a naval blockade and just go on a pirate hunting extravaganza until October of 1803, when the USS Philadelphia would get hung up on an uncharted reef right off the coast of Tripoli. The pirates seize this opportunity. They attack the USS Philadelphia, board it, take the crew hostage, and then over the next couple months they were able to repair it enough to get it back into the harbor at Tripoli where they then anchored it in place and used it as fixed artillery because it had way more guns than any other vessel they had. Cue our first main character, mm. Stephen Decatur, the commander of the USS Enterprise, America's unofficial flagship. He decides that he's going to don his plot armor, take the USS Enterprise out, and acquire himself a pirate ship, which he does. He then <laughs> takes... <laughs> Oh, that's why I love this channel. <laughs> Quiet. <laughs> like, I'm gonna buy a, a pirate ship. Okay, dude. <laughs> takes that pirate ship and the USS Enterprise and sails both of them. Yes, yeah, but I believe it. That's the thing. Five Sicilian mercenaries that know how to speak Arabic. They then sail back to mm. Tripoli, where Decatur and 80 Marines are gonna go below deck of this pirate ship, which has now been christened the USS Intrepid, as the five mercenaries are going to sail directly into the heart of the harbor, pretending to be Barbary pirates. They okay. then go directly to the USS Philadelphia. 80 Marines and Stephen Decatur run out, kill the entire crew of pirates that are on the USS Philadelphia, yeah. and reclaim it. Unfortunately, the USS Philadelphia is too damaged to actually be used as a ship ever again, at which point Stephen Decatur decides, fine, we're just going to burn the entire thing to the ground because if we can't have it, nobody can. Deprive the enemy of nice things. I'm pretty sure Sun Tzu said that. So that's exactly what they do. They light the USS Philadelphia on fire. They're positive it can't be put out. And then they bounce. Not a single American is injured. And Stephen Decatur is hailed a hero because he has now led what is, in my opinion, America's first special operations mission. So now that that's taken care of. See, that's the, the amazing thing again about these videos is I think we, at least I, of course, but, but uh, I suspect a lot of you guys, we are learning great stuff uh, about American history. Um, this is really, really, I mean, it is an incredible storytelling. I said this a couple of times, but I, I, I really mean it. Of the problem at hand is that the crew of the USS Philadelphia is still being... And I feel like, even though I still pause a lot, but I feel like I pause much less on his videos because he's, he, he keeps going, going and going. It's fantastic held hostage by the Barbary pirates, and they want a ton of money in exchange for them back. However, mm. America no longer negotiates with terrorists, and that's not an option. Cue our next two main characters, William Eaton and Presley O'Bannon. And before you ask, yes, Presley O'Bannon, as in the USS O'Bannon, the Fletcher-class destroyer from World War II that sank a Japanese submarine with potatoes. So they go in and they pitch their idea of... 
Yet another great story that I have to check because I'm not aware of that. How they're going to get the crew of the USS Philadelphia back, and it is by every definition, a special operations mission. Basically, they wanna take themselves two dudes plus six Marines for a total of eight guys, and they're gonna get dropped off in Egypt because in Egypt is Yusuf Karmali's brother that is living in exile because Yusuf kicked him out because he is technically the rightful heir of Tripoli. So they're okay. gonna get that guy and all the buddies that are loyal to him, like 500 men, and then they're gonna march them through the desert to Derna, where they are then going to use them to fight and take over the city and exchange the city for the crew of the USS Philadelphia. And upon here, okay, this plan, I suspect it will work, but as everything to not work, you know. During this ridiculous plan, the U.S. military leadership is like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. We want to take a small contingency of men be dropped off in a foreign country, meet up with a rebel leader who already has a bunch of men, and then yeah. convince him that you're going to help him overthrow a current dictator, and then he can be the new dictator, and basically we're using other people to fight other people that we don't like to benefit us. And Presley O'Bannon and Eaton are like, yeah, that's that's pretty much exactly <laughs> it. And the government is like... <laughs> yeah, that's the plan. I mean, yep, yeah, uh, that's what we are thinking about. We are 10, they are 5,000, does not matter. I mean, they mess with us, now we have to do our thing. And it will work, that's the thing. I, I really have a feeling this will work. It's like, this is a terrific idea. I mean, we're probably never ever gonna do anything like this ever again, and we're not gonna have an entire branch of special forces that specializes in it. Sorry, anyways, that's exactly what they do. They get dropped off in Egypt, they track down- <laughs> This is another crazy story. Okay, well, let's see it. Hamet, they're like, hey, you want to go overthrow your brother? Cool, grab your guys, let's go. Somewhere along the way, the Marines also picked up 50 Greek mercenaries as they all began marching 500 miles through the Libyan desert to get back to the Tripolitan coast. And this march through the desert mm. takes 50 days and it is a complete shit show because somewhere along the way, they start running low on supplies and they have to start rationing. And then some people get mad. There's accusations because the Greek guys are Christian, Hamet's guys are Muslims. There's fighting amongst themselves, and there's these eight Marines standing in the middle, desperately trying to keep them from killing each other as they march through the desert. So, despite multiple mutiny attempts and a okay, this is looking bad now because me, yeah, okay, let, let's see it. Ton of fights, the Marines were able to keep this group together enough to make it through the Libyan desert till they arrived at the yeah, that's good. city of Bomba. Once they get there, they meet up with the USS Argus that gives them a bunch of supplies so they can start eating food again, and they give enough money to pay off the Greek mercenaries. Then, Eaton decides that he's going to send a letter over to the governor of Derna right next door, because remember, we can't attack unless they're potentially aggressive. Okay, so he sends a letter and is basically like, hey, I'm going to march my army through the middle of your town to go kill your boss on my way to Tripoli. Um... Can I have some safe passage and maybe some food? The governor of Derna sends a letter back that says, my head or yours, which sounds potentially aggressive enough. So they begin making the plan for the ground attack. Hamet and his men are going to take the governor's palace and the Marines and the Greek mercenaries are going to take out the harbor fortress. But to okay. do that, they're going to need a cannon from the USS Argus. So they're going to meet up with it, go get this cannon and prepare for their attack. Cut back to Stephen Decatur. While all this has been happening, there's still been a naval battle in the Mediterranean the entire time. And Stephen Decatur is on an absolute rampage because after he captured his first pirate ship, he would receive word that his brother, James Decatur, had been mortally wounded by one of the pirate ship's captains who was pretending to surrender before shooting his younger brother. Oh boy. Upon hearing this, Decatur immediately gives command of the new captured vessel to one of his men, leaves a couple guys with him, and takes off to track down this pirate ship that just killed his brother. So they chase down this pirate ship, they pull- I've, In a weird way, I'm, I almost feel bad for that pirate ship because they have no idea what's coming, but they, they, they deserve it pull up right next to it and before the crew has time to do any boarding procedures you know like break out the planks tie some ropes to the other ship all that stuff you see in the movies nah Stephen Decatur jumps into the enemy ship and starts killing pirates immediately nine marines seeing that happen are like oh shit we're doing this so they jump onto the pirate ship too and start throwing down at which point the pirate ship veers off and breaks away from Decatur's ship it is now nine marines and Stephen Decatur versus over 30 pirates on this vessel and 30 is not going to be enough Stephen Decatur kills multiple pirates, including the captain that had slain his brother, officially avenging his brother's death, capturing that vessel. Oh, okay. This is a crazy, crazy story. 
Is this real? Because this is really fantastic. <laughs> But he is still absolutely furious that his brother died, and he continues to go on a rampage, capturing another pirate ship and destroying three more over the coming weeks. Cut back to the men on the ground, eating and- That guy was in a mission. Oh no. I mean, oh yes, that was... This is... I, I just hope those, all of those stories are, are real, because I love to, to learn about them. Band had been getting their battle plan ready this entire time. They just had their men go get a cannon off the USS mm. Argus because they really, really need this cannon if they're going to be able to pull off this mission. So they're ready to attack. The US Navy gets into formation and they are going to bombard the entire city of Derna while they launch this attack. Despite that, there's over 2,000 men loyal to Pasha Yusuf that are going to defend it and they are heavily outnumbered. So Navy starts bombarding the shore. Hamet and his men take off to go attack the governor's palace and Eaton, O'Bannon, the Marines and the Greek mercenaries begin launching their attack on the harbor fortress. They open up with the initial cannon fire, which is gonna be vital to be able to break through the enemy lines okay. and establish their foothold. They fire the cannon. As they go to reload and fire it again, they realize that they had accidentally forgot to take the ramrod out of the cannon and shot that at the enemy too. Now the cannon's completely out and they're kind of like, oh shit, what do we do? What do we do? And Presley O'Bannon just charges into battle as the other Marines follow behind him and the Greek mercenaries behind them. They attack so quickly and so violently that they're able to overrun the entire enemy fortress before anybody really knows what's going on. And Presley... Oh man, this, this, story keep, this story keeps getting crazier and crazier. Am I tripping on this? A bunch of... navies... Like, I guess I can call them navies, right? are going to win again a bunch oh no <laughs> wow Leslie O'Bannon becomes the first American ever to raise the Star Spangled Banner over a foreign battlefield. This battle, the taking of the oh. Tripolitan coastal city of Derna, is enshrined in Marine Corps history in the Marine Corps hymn with the line from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. And it is also where the Marine Corps would get their first nickname ever because the seven Marines present for this battle fought so hard and so violently that they simply became known as the Leathernecks, referring to the leather collar that they wore around their neck to protect it from slashes from pirate swords so you said wow that's insane that's super super insane this story again i'm gonna tell this to my friends <laughs> men end up getting beaten back and are forced to retreat to Tripoli, at which point the Marines, the Greeks, and Hamet and his men all consolidate, figure out what happened. Hamet okay. and his men were able to take over the governor's palace, and after the taking of the city of Derna, Hamet awards his very own sword to Presley O'Bannon as a gift for how valiantly he fought in battle. And this is the Mameluke sword, the same sword that is on the Marine Corps uniform today. So now Yusuf consolidates his military, sends an... Again, fun... Fantastic uh, video, lots of again amazing humor, but a lot of a lot of great great information. I I love this enormous army back to Derna to try to take it back over, and they're kind of just sitting on the outskirts of the city, waiting for the right moment to attack. Mm. Eaton and O'Bannon are writing correspondence to the U.S. military in the chain of command, like, "Hey, we took this entire city with like eight Marines. Give us some reinforcements. We're gonna go take Tripoli next, and then we'll just overthrow this entire country." This goes on okay. for over a month, and they defend the city multiple times from attacks from Yusuf's men. And eventually, Eaton receives a letter informing him that he is to stand down and just leave because American diplomat Tobias Locke has struck up a deal with Yusuf Carmenali. And apparently he struck up this deal with absolutely nobody's permission because the deal is America is gonna pay Yusuf Carmenali, the pirate king, $60,000. And in exchange, we are gonna receive the USS Philadelphia back as well as a peace treaty that they are gonna leave American ships alone from now on. So yeah, everybody's pretty pissed. I think, honestly, that deal was good for America off about it from Thomas Jefferson, Presley O'Bannon, William Eaton, Stephen Decatur. They're all furious that we are now giving $60,000 to this. I mean, but uh, okay, maybe I, I'm not judging this correct, but f after that, they will not mess with America anymore. So, you know, I, I don't know. Pirate King, as opposed to overthrowing his entire city of Tripoli, or at a minimum using the fact that they're holding Derna and use that as leverage to exchange. But whatever, okay. the war's over, I guess.
for now. So the peace treaties were signed in 1805. Now, fast forward seven years, 1812, the War of 1812 happens. Okay, if you don't know, the War of 1812, there's more to it than this, but the reason that it started is mm. that Great Britain wanted to have more control over the seas and trade because America was getting too much because America was no longer getting attacked by pirates because we just beat them in a war now too. So, Makes Great sense. Britain launches another war against America. During this war, they encouraged- Okay, I was not aware of this war, by the way. Oh man, now I want to react to that. Bridge the Barbary pirates to start attacking American vessels again. And honestly, it works out pretty good for the pirates, at least for a little while, because the American Navy is too busy to worry about them because their hands are full with the British Navy. Fast forward two years, eight months later, the War of 1812 ends. Now, luckily for the Barbary pirates, Thomas Jefferson is no longer president at this point. We are on to America's fourth president. Let me check my notes here. Um... James Madison, if you don't know, James Madison is one half of what is referred to as the forefathers dynamic duo, and the other half is his best friend of all time, Thomas Jefferson. And I don't know if you figured this out yet at this point in the story, but Thomas Jefferson hates pirates. So yeah, sitting President I'm James aware. Madison, being the homie that he is, looks over at now Commodore Stephen Decatur and says, Go get him, Tiger. He then proceeds to assemble the largest U.S. naval fleet ever at this point in time and sails directly to the Barbary Coast. He then immediately tracks down Algiers' flagship, the Mashuda, takes it out, captures over 400 members of its crew, and the ship itself. He then proceeds to take all of his gunboats directly to Algiers, park them in the port, and say, here's the deal. You're going to surrender, and you're never going to collect tribute from anyone ever again, or I'm going to overthrow your entire country. Obviously... I think I would pick the, the option number one. They take the first option, at which point yeah. Decatur's like, okay, cool, next order of business. You're also going to pay me back for all the U.S. merchandise that you plundered during the War of 1812. And they're like, okay, here you go. They give it to him. He then proceeds to sail his fleet next door to Tunis and tell them the exact same thing, ordering them to sign a peace treaty, never raid an American vessel again, and then collects a bunch of money. He then sails them next door again to Tripoli, and does the exact same thing, collects all this money, gets the peace treaties, the Barbary pirates never mess with America ever again, Decatur and his fleet sail back home, and he tells the government what happened. The American government is blown away. This was fantastic. I mean, end up working perfectly. No, they end up accepting. I mean, they, they had no alternative, but... At the results that Decatur was able to achieve, when asked how he managed to not only get peace treaties without too much violence, but also get a bunch of money and concessions on top of it, all Decatur said was, peace was achieved through the mouth of our cannons, at which point he was given the nickname the conqueror of the Barbary pirates. And with the rest of the world seeing a new country in its infancy stand up for itself against the Barbary pirates and winning, they would start doing it too, and everybody started fighting back and quit paying tribute to the Barbary pirates and in the honestly amazing stuff done by America I mean and is the symbolism that ended up representing like is, is explaining other countries also thought yeah if Americans did this we might be able to do it also so really really good stuff coming years they would fade into nothing as their 300 year reign of terror had come to an end so in conclusion the moral of the story is please for the love of God do yeah. not mess no. with America's boats uh, I'm with you watching best way to support the channel is go buy some merch over the fatelectrician.com quack bang out I mean fantastic video and again that is part one of the origin story of how America became the world police to give you a hint part two ends after the Korean War when NATO gets founded wait what <laughs> Okay, my, my friends, uh, amazing video by Nick, Fred Electrician, always does great stuff. Uh, leave a like if you enjoy this type of reactions, it's always the best way to, to show support, like I said at the beginning of the video. Check my Patreon if you want to, to so give me access to support, you don't have to do it, but if you want to do it, I would appreciate it. And this is everything for today. See you guys next time. Bye, my friends.